you very much for coming today. My name is Aaron Woodrick. I'm the director of the Domestic Policy Program here at the Macdonald Moore Institute. Very pleased today to um, welcome you to this in-person event, um, a rarity for our domestic policy program, but hopefully more frequent very soon, entitled A Third Way for Drug Addiction Policy in Canada. We have with us today two very eminent folks um, who are expert in this area, and they're going to talk about some work they've been doing. Um, a paper just released today entitled Canada's Health Crisis, Profiling Opioid Addiction in Alberta and British Columbia. Um, so first we have Dr. Keith Humphreys to my left here. He is the Esther Ting Memorial Professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. And we have beside him Blair Gibbs, who is a policy consultant and former senior advisor to former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Now, uh, there's obviously a lot to discuss uh, with this issue. This is a serious public health crisis affecting obviously not just Canada, but the United States and many other places in the world. Um, I thought maybe we would start, uh, Blair and Keith, if you wanted to talk a bit about the study, what it, what it is and what your findings are. Great, yeah, thank you, Aaron, and thanks for the opportunity to, to host this event and, and speak about this issue. So. Um, just to give people a bit of background, I had worked on these issues in the UK before I moved to Canada and both at the city level in London and the national level with the, the Prime Minister's office and the Ministry of Justice. And so I was familiar with these issues from a kind of English context and uh, had always been quite passionate about what we could do to improve the response to addiction and all the associated um, crime and social consequences that, that flow from it. So. I moved to Canada, I, moved, I live in Vancouver now, so a, a place that many people regard as the sort of epi, epicenter of the, the addiction crisis in, in this country. And I'd always been um, curious to understand a bit more about how Canada had approached this issue compared to, for example, the United States. So um, Keith, is, as many will know, is, is, is one of the leading experts in the, in the world on this issue and, and led the Lancet um, Commission's inquiry on, on the US crisis. And, there's been a lot of media discussion about the US. And I suppose when, when the opportunity came, Keith's program funded a piece of research that, that we're releasing today. We, we looked at Canada because we were interested in what, what really is different about this situation in Canada, if, if at all. And, and to what extent do we need to pay more attention to what's happening in Canada versus the policies and the approaches that have been taken in the US. So. Uh, I, do, you know, I, I encourage people to have a look at the, the research that we've released. It's on the Stanford Network for Addiction Policy website. And in that, basically, we're trying to sort of profile the, the problem as it stands today and put it in context for people, because I think a lot of people are aware of the, the issue of opioid addiction. Um, it's certainly been building in this country for two decades or, or more. Um, and I should say that we're not in this report trying to evaluate the policy responses. So. I have certain views on maybe the direction of travel that's been taken, um, but really what we're trying to do with the report is put the harms of, of opioid addiction in, in, in context. So, for example, um, one of the things that I think really shocked me was if you think about deaths from um, opioid addiction or, as they uh, count them, apparent accidental opioid toxicity deaths, in Canada as a whole, in the uh, two years of 2020 to 2021, uh, I think I'm right in saying 13,815 deaths were recorded. Now, compared to obviously the main years of the pandemic in the same time, a lower number of deaths. But of course, people who are dying of opioid addiction are typically much younger. So if you try and capture this in terms of the loss of life potential, if you like, productive years of life, um, it vastly um, outweighs the, the loss of productive years from, from, from the COVID pandemic. So something in the order of 450,000 years of lost life potential from those deaths in Canada just over those two years compared to about 90,000 for, for the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, this really is, I think, the preeminent public health crisis in Canada today. Um, there are some early signs that there may be some improvement. We may have reached some sort of plateau, but the scale and the cost of this in human terms is, is horrific. And I think it just warrants um, uh, a lot closer attention in terms of what the provinces and the federal government could be doing to, to make a meaningful, meaningful difference. 
Yeah, that's an excellent summary. I'll just add a little bit to give you a sense of the scale. So um, if you're as old as me or older, you remember HIV AIDS and the international response to that terrible epidemic. Uh, the acute death rate at the height of HIV in both the US and Canada was lower than what we're seeing now from drug overdose. So this is the worst uh, epidemic of the sort I've ever lived through and probably, probably any of us have ever lived through. Another way I gauge it for people is, uh, and this was something we, we looked at in the commission, is you know, how, how do you get people to understand the scale of death if you go back to the late 90s when this all starts, originally with prescription opioids, then transitioning into heroin and now into fentanyl. And it's that the uh, number of Canadians and Americans who have died uh, from opioids is larger than the number who died in World War I and World War II put together. That's how serious this is. Despite that, we have not had a response of the same level of seriousness that we took to COVID and we took to HIV. I think because of the nature of the problem, sometimes the moral uh, uh, valence of the problem, people being scared of the problem, stigma and so on, it really hasn't gotten, you know, this certainly gets lots of headlines and there's lots of suffering, but in terms of a thoughtful policy response, it's remarkable uh, that it is not far more uh, developed than it is, given this has now been going on for uh, almost a quarter century. Okay. Well, look, we've got lots of things to unpack. Um, I did want to start with the specific uh, provinces that you focused on in this study, Blair. You focused on Alberta and British Columbia. Folks yeah. who follow this issue will know that in the news, um, this is sort of, th there's been a very sharp distinction drawn between the approaches that governments are taking in these two provinces. So uh, maybe it would be helpful if you could sort of outline what some of those differences are. And, you know, is there, is the difference as large as uh, sort of proponents of one school or another would like make it out to be, or is there a bit of sort of political theater involved here? So um, we, we wanted to look at BC and Alberta. Um, well, partly I, I live in BC and, and my uh, lead research partner, Ryan uh, Workman, who's here today, lives in, lives in Alberta. But, but the real reason we, we wanted to focus there is obviously because, and, and many people know this, there is a higher um, rate of uh, drug um, deaths and harm generally across those two provinces. So uh, about a quarter of the Canadian population, but um, basically half of all deaths occur in these two provinces. Now, um, one thing I should say actually, and this is one of the things that we, we, we point out in the recommendations, is that if you want to go below that level, so if you want to really drill down into data that's at the municipal level, um, it's much harder. So published data that allows for easy comparisons is really at provincial level. But even at that level, um, you can see that British Columbia, for example, is by far and away um, the epicenter of this crisis. And more than just the, the metrics maybe around, say, um, deaths or hospitalizations, but just the, the issue of drugs in society, I suppose, would be a, a better way of putting it. So we looked a bit, for example, at drug crime, um, so offenses that are um, recorded nationally but are broken down by drug type and, and by type of offence, so either a possession offence or a more serious offence like trafficking or, or, or distribution. Um, British Columbia, in terms of incidence of opioid um, crime incidents, has more than half of the entire national um, uh, number for, for those types of incidents. So, and prevalence rates generally for drug consumption are higher in Western Canada than in other, other parts of, of, of the country too. Um, now, yeah, Aaron, you're right, there's definitely been a, um, a sort of renewal in the kind of interest of, of the media and policymakers in what those two provinces are doing differently. Um, and I think there is definitely a difference in terms of framing and emphasis, uh, which we can talk a bit more about in terms of Alberta's new push around recovery and having a recovery-oriented system of, of care. British Columbia used to, probably still does, regard itself as the sort of pioneer of taking kind of innovative approaches, progressive approaches to, to tackling addiction. Um, and of course they were the province that, that, that pioneered things like safe consumption sites and, and, and safe supply and, um, and, and needle exchanges, etc. But um, what's quite interesting now is that there seems to be a developing divergence between those two provinces, even though there is quite a lot of overlap in what they actually fund and the services they provide. So um, naloxone, which many of you will know is a, is a life-saving treatment in a sort of uh, paramedic scenario, is a, um, is a common, um, commonly distributed service and, and, and provision across both, 
both provinces. Both Alberta and British Columbia have safe consumption sites of, of different types, but about the same number. We, we produce a very headline summary of the, the differences between those two provinces in this, in this handout. But I think the, the main point is that both provinces have got a very elevated level of drug harms and hospitalizations that each province wasn't dealing with 10 years ago. So British Columbia had a strategy 2000 now, so over 20 years ago, um, which was published, or rather the city of Vancouver published a, a, a four-pillar strategy, which was at the start of a, of a crisis that at the time um, nobody could have imagined would balloon to the, to the level it is now. So uh, hundreds of deaths in the province at that time and we're now um, into the thousands. So um, there is definitely um, merit, I think, for the country as a whole to look at both of these provinces and see how they've performed, see what policies have had an impact and, and frankly which ones have not. Um, and I think if we can make some progress in BC and or Alberta, then there are some lessons for the, for the whole country and you could improve the, the performance across the board. Yeah. Just to add, add to that is even when services overlap a lot, and as the report shows, Alberta and British Columbia are doing many things that are the same. The orienting philosophy, why are you doing them? What is the goal? What are people held accountable to do? can be different, and I, and I see that between the two provinces. And I'm from, I'm from Palo Alto, California, just south of San Francisco. We're having the same, San Francisco's very much same kind of debate going on about you know, harm reduction, recovery, uh, and so on. And it's not that anybody is saying, let's get rid of needle exchange, let's get rid of naloxone. Why would you want to do that? They, they both save a lot of lives. But it's that what is the purpose of all these investments? Is it uh, to uh, assume that every human being who has an addiction can recover and become healthier, be a contributor to society and so on, or is it uh, more, well, you know, the best they can do is just they'll always be addicted to drugs, but we'll try to make them overdose somewhat less frequently. And that's the most you can expect. And when you have that sort of more pessimistic take, it does sort of drift down through it. And, and, and there's different rationales. Some would say that, and, and it is wrong to say that is any less. Even what I just said, that that's pessimistic. No, there's nothing wrong with, there's no difference really between a life of using fentanyl five times a day for the rest of your life versus a life of recovery. Let's not impose those judgments on there. Um, you know, that's an important debate to have, but just to say those, those judgments make a big difference in terms of how people think about their jobs, uh, how they think about what it is I'm trying to accomplish here, and also, very importantly, what it's like to encounter these systems as someone who's seeking help. So if the meta message is, you know, this is the best you can do, uh, that's one that, ha that has effects on you. As it does, you say, you know, this is what you can do now, but in the long term, there could be a lot more for you and we'd like to help you get there. That's a different message to give people and those things really end up mattering a lot. Okay, maybe we can unpack that a bit more, Keith, because I think the argument that a lot of people will raise there is saying, well, of course we want people to recover. Um, but first of all, we can't pressure them. It might not be possible to convince them um, and, and that pressuring them doesn't work. So I'm wondering if you can speak to, are there, are there any examples of other places? I know in Alberta there is an emphasis on, on trying to get people to seek treatment. Are there places where putting more emphasis on recovery has, has shown successful results? Yeah, and thanks for bringing that up. Because, you know, so I, I, I teach, uh, I, I work in a psychiatry department, I teach young doctors who are going to, going to uh, become professional uh, caregivers for people in addiction. We, we teach them about the four L's. Why do people come in to seek help for addiction? Four L's are liver, lover, livelihood, or, and the law. And sometimes some combination of life. It was actually the normative case when someone comes in. It's, it, at some level, they don't quite want to be there. It's their boss said, you keep doing this, I'm going to fire you. Or the cop said, you know, I arrested you for drink driving, you can, you can go to jail or you can do this. Or their spouse said, clean up or get out. That, that's normative in the condition. So the, the idea that uh, nobody can, we never should put pressure on people, but also that it ha has an inherently destructive effect is, is completely untrue. And if you know, as I do, many people are in recovery from addiction, it's remarkable how often their story uh, of their, uh, uh, their struggle and then in getting better comes with gratitude towards the people who used to make them really mad. Mm -hmm. You know, I got so sick of my nagging boss, my annoying wife, that stupid cop, and now like, you know, and, I, and now I just think, thank God for my nagging wife, thank God for my, my boss, thank God for that cop that put me in this situation. That makes this condition a bit different mm -hmm. than many other you know, health conditions that we deal with where the person has subjectively a huge desire throughout, like, I do, you know, like chronic pain. No one in chronic pain is ambivalent about getting rid of it at all. 
if, you know, as soon as they can, they would. But often in addiction, there is that ambivalence, and therefore some pressure is needed. And, and we do see, you know, that people who in, are pressured into treatment do as well or better than people who come in voluntarily. I see. Um, Blair, I wanted to circle back to uh, some of the similarities and differences between British Columbia and Alberta. Obviously, all of the focus in Alberta is on, on, on treatment and recovery, and I know there's a lot of money being poured into sort of recovery centers. I wanted to talk a bit about the safe injection sites and this debate over safe supply or public supply. Um, you know, there are those that make the point that, well, you can't help someone recover if they're dead, so you need to keep them alive, and the, the sort of uh, the theoretical purpose of safe supply or public supply is that you give them a drug that's pure, that, that, that it's not going to kill them in the meantime, so they get a chance to recover. Um, um, you know, and then the flip side, uh, people argue, well, uh, some people may simply sell this safe supply, you may actually increase the overall supply of drug inadvertently, unintentionally. Um, in Alberta, I mean, because I think a lot of people aren't familiar with the model there, are they, have they, have they um, moved away from safe or public supply? Like, are people able to access drugs to get to the keep them alive stage before they get to recovery? What's, what is the status quo in Alberta? Yeah, so I, mean, I think that the, the, the broad point to make, first of all, is that there's a, there shouldn't be um, an antagonism between two positions. The one that Keith articulated, which is what is the purpose of the services that you're funding? What is the expectation mm -hmm. of people in need? When they access these services, what's their journey? What's the pathway that they're on? Does it include recovery um, or not? And also a recognition that clearly in British Columbia and also Alberta, the uh, toxicity of the illicit supply is the primary driver of the deaths. So it's not, it's not the case, for example, that um, you know, British Columbia has seen this you know, huge increase in deaths because out of nowhere, the user base dramatically doubled in size, for example. Now, right. now the caveat there is we don't really have good enough data on, on how many drug users are out there. We rely on self-report surveys. But if we take those at face value, we, we're not seeing an increase in, if you like, in uh, community drug use or um, uh, there might be some increase in the concentration of drug users. But again, we don't have good data on where, for example, people reside or where they've come from. Um, so, so, but there is this general point that I think we do accept in the, in the research that, that we've um, produced, which is that fentanyl uh, is, is the driver. And, this, and the, the correlation across the provinces is striking. So provinces where fentanyl is detected at a much lower rate in the, in the drug seized by the police, uh, just, they just have a much lower death rate. Um, so, so there's something there interesting, I think, about the geography of Western Canada, the um, uh, importation routes for the illicit supply. Of course, much of it was um, uh, known to come from China. Now more of it is coming from Mexico. But there is something there about the exposure, I think, of British Columbia as a, uh, as a sort of Pacific-facing province, but also a, you know, in, a, in a place like Vancouver, an area with a major port, uh, many major ports, and lots of potential for, for trafficking in that way. Um, but overall, in terms of safe supply, you can do safe supply and invest in recovery as well. Um, now, Alberta, Keith, Keith will know more than me on this, but Alberta has not gone so far as British Columbia in terms of um, promoting safe supply in terms of postal dispatch, for example. Um, so it's, and then in terms of regulating consumption sites, Alberta, the Alberta government quite recently was quite, um, quite explicit in saying it wanted more regulation about how these sites operated. Um, now, I'm not casting any aspersions on anyone who works in these um, uh, uh, facilities or, 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 or governs or operates them, but what I found quite interesting was how difficult it was to get very basic information about the services that some of these consumption sites offer. So not even, not even asking to see peer-reviewed evidence on the impact of their clients over you know, several years since they were first in contact. I mean, that, that, that takes time and investment and, and, and maybe those studies are underway. But simply just the, the range of services they provide, a caseload count for the number of people engaging with their services, these things are not routinely published. And of course, these are taxpayer-funded services in these in these provinces. So you could argue that there's a there's a good case for a lot more transparency around how those 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 sites operate. Yeah, the, it's a really critical difference of when you give somebody strong opioids. Do you watch 
or do you hand them a bottle and then send them out in the community? And you can see that going back to the, you know, the original start of this opioid crisis, let's, which by the way, let's remember, this all started with legally produced drugs, you know, made in, in le legal ways, given out by highly trained medical professionals. So the idea that as long as it's legal, you're not gonna have trouble is, is not true. But why did Canada end up in, with a much more serious situation than, say, Germany, where, where opiate per capita is very similar? Mm. It's because Canada had a much higher rate of ambulatory prescriptions. It's about four times as high. So Germans will give a fair amount of opiates in the hospital, in the hospice, in the nursing home, but it's much less common to say, Here, here's a bottle of uh, 30 pills, go out there and take them the right way. The second you do that, you introduce a lot of different types of risks. Um, you know, inadvertent risk to, you know, the kid in, a kid in the house take, takes the pill, conscious risk of a person selling them, sharing them. Quite a few people also initiate other people into addiction with their, with their medication. The way Alberta is doing its, its sort of version of, of, uh, uh, of providing these is a, is a lot more like what the Swiss did. So they do have this, I think it's called narcotic transfer program, I could have that, that, that government name wrong, but I, can t I know I have the principles right, which if someone is extremely disorganized, can't engage in any type of treatment, they will provide hydromorphone, which is a, a certainly quite strong opioid, um, to them to get them stabilized, but it's done in a clinic with uh, you know, p medical people there, it's not handed to them, whereas in the model that is called safe supply, and I think should really just be called community supply, because whether or not it's safe is an empirical question. You're actually handed those drugs and trusted to go out there and take them exactly as recommended, not to share them with anyone. I think those are mistakes to make that assumption, but anyway, that is the, that is the difference. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, uh, the law and decriminalization. Um, obviously, British Columbia just announced that it was going to decriminalize certain substances. I mean, <clears throat> maybe Keith, this can speak to your sort of broader expertise. What's the sort of track record? Like, does this have a big impact on you know, the, the, the number of deaths, the number of people who are sort of reluctant to seek treatment, does it make things better, does it make things worse? What's, what's the sort of track record of decriminalization? Yeah, so this is a really complicated issue. First, we should probably define the term. So mm -hmm. when some people think, you say decriminalization, what they're thinking is we will have companies selling recreational heroin, for example. <laughs> and that's usually not how we use that term. We usually call that legalization, legalization of production, sales, marketing, like we have for cannabis, for example. Sure. Decriminalization is usually much more focused. Do we want to use criminal penalties against the user for the use per se. Um, you know, in the, in the Lancet Commission, we said at least for use per se, possession, the common penalty in my country, not so much yours, incarceration is actually cruel and very dangerous. People, uh, it's so horrible to go through withdrawal, but then they come out, they don't have t tolerance, they're more likely to overdose. So you want to try to avoid those things if a person is imposing some broader public safety threat. I mean, if they're out there you know, mugging, attacking, breaking the house, that's different. But just for the use per se, that would be the I ideal. Um, but when you pull that back, you do have to ask, is there anything else that will put some constraints on use? And this is where culture comes in. So I've spent a lot of time in Portugal. Portugal is often invoked as, you know, they pulled back legally and they didn't have a lot of use. Like, yeah, that's true, but you know, Portugal is a small, conservative, family-oriented uh, country. Uh, it's amazing how many people you meet in, say, Lisbon who've lived there all their lives, and by the way, their mom and dad live there, and their mom and dad live there, and if you use drugs on the street, it would probably get back to your mom and your dad. That's a different kind of country and place than, say, a San Francisco or, or a Vancouver, where a lot of people are individual, unattached, they came from somewhere else. Sometimes they came there specifically to get away from social controls. They're port cities with kind of a history of celebrating intoxication. They have a lot of bars. They have a lot of cannabis. It's sort of a, you know, um, you know a live, live as you see fit, sort of more libertarian sensibility. In those places, when you pull the law back, there's really nothing left restraining. It's not Portugal. And so we're not seeing Portuguese outcomes in San Francisco or Portland, Oregon, Oregon recently, uh, the state of Oregon recently decriminalized, or Vancouver. And I think that's why. There's just no constraint anymore and uh, so it's just that the last, uh, I guess the last bit of the, the gate has just, has just disappeared. And, and so you see an awful lot of use and sadly an awful lot of, of uh, death. I would add as well that, you know, as, as Keith says with Portugal, the one thing that they created and still maintain is this quite novel idea of a dissuasion kind of commission as a sort of quasi-judicial nudge to, to have the police involved at the point of you know, detection, if you like, for a, for a possession offence, but then di diverted away from the criminal court process into something else, but, but into something else, which has then certain um, 
levers to you know, enable that person, if they, if they so choose, to enter, enter into treatment. British Columbia's decriminalisation plan, I, as far as I'm aware, has none of that sort of element of the Portuguese um, approach as well. So my, my concern with it would generally be that there's a kind of... Um, seems to be a belief now that enforcement or even the police themselves have no part to play in this and that they're not a useful part of the response, that every intervention by a police officer is a negative one. Uh, even every arrest is, is un, you know, an unjustified one if it's a possession offence. Um, what's interesting about British Columbia is that they, of course, were, they weren't in a position where they were making a lot of possession arrests until last year, for example. So the narrative, yeah, the, na the narrative that this, this, for example, was a major continuing driver of both the stigma and the criminalization of, of users is just not borne out by the data. I mean, you know, over the last five years, I think, and, and we show this in the report, that there's been a steady decline in possession um, charges in, in British Columbia. So federal permission to then formally decriminalize is a kind of the natural next step, uh, how workable it is, I'm not sure, you know, setting a 2.5 gram limit is, you know, puts a lot of um, um, onus on the police officers and, in, in, you know, in the street to sort of make those judgments and I'm not sure how workable it will be, but they've been on this journey for some time. Um, what would concern me a bit more is at the same time as possession offences have been, um, you know, uh, deep, there's been this de-policing, if you like, of possession, which you know, you could argue has some health benefits. There, there's also been this big retrenchment against more serious drug crime. So when we looked at data around offences like trafficking and possession, uh, trafficking, sorry, distribution, importation, you know, the number of people charged in British Columbia for these offences is measured in the dozens or scores of cases at most every year. You know, these are not very um, uh, easy cases to prosecute clearly and, and detecting these kind of cases particularly involving um, fentanyl which is you know, so much easier to smuggle you know, it's, it's not an easy job but I would just question whether or not that shows um, the right level of focus from law enforcement you know, the, the, the quid pro quo almost was the war on drugs the first way if you like was a failure principally because it, it, it you know, had this huge net widening effect and ended up scooping up a lot of a lot of people for relatively minor offences which would then have life you know long 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 term impacts for their life life chances the same is true in England the same is true obviously in the United States as well um, but the kind of deal was that, that the police would continue to uphold the law against serious drug crime which at the end of the day is an organized criminal um, enterprise which is exploiting the very people who are addicted so so you could stand behind a kind of decriminalization agenda on possession, I think politically, if you wanted also to say, look, but for the same purpose, we're going to be investing more in prosecuting more serious drug crime. That hasn't been happening either. Um, so I think there's a sort of debate there to be had about the role of enforcement and whether or not the balance has been got right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk uh, maybe you first, Keith, on um, the idea of the crisis as more a sort of demand-driven problem than a supply-driven problem. Mm -hmm. There's sort of two schools on this. I mean, one says that the problem is we have a lot of drugs out there and they're easily accessible and that's why yeah. more people are doing it. And then the other is, well, maybe there, there are more people, there's more inequality, there's more poverty, there are more, there's more uh, mental health issues, mm -hmm. and that it's a demand-driven problem. And if we address those sort of root causes, we can, we can get the problem under control. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, you know, supply and demand chase each other in, 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 in circles, sure. right? So, you know, there was no demand for fentanyl originally. It was, in, it was invented on the supply side because it's dramatically more profitable than heroin. You know, synthetic drug, don't need land in Afghanistan, don't need 8,000 miles supply lines and all that. But, of course, once it was introduced into the supply, now people demand it. So people, once they've had it, they, they may have been exposed initially uh, by accident, but now they're saying, I want to purchase fentanyl. So in some ways, those things are hard to fully pull apart. The, the, I think another part of your question, which is really important, is the sort of the root cause idea. If we just sort of solved long-term issues around poverty and inequality and alienation, would this go away? And um, I'm, I, I, poverty is bad for human health. I would love there not to be poverty. But I don't think for this issue, that's the right lens to look at it. And I put it in a number of ways. So, so many, many Americans say, you know, if we had less inequality, we wouldn't have this problem. 
and, or if, and we've had universal health care, we wouldn't have this problem. Not aware that Canada has these things and has this problem. Or when you look around the world, you would say, now where is there going to be addiction? Surely that's going to be poor countries suffer the worst and rich countries are the best off. Exactly backwards. It is much, much more a rich, person, rich country's problem than a poor country's problem. In part because this is a condition, it's not like depression. You can be depressed for free. You know, um, being addicted, you're buying a commodity. You know, there is money involved. There is a transaction. So having more wealth allows countries to buy more drugs, pull more in, and which creates, you know, in, increases demand and in, increases risk. The other really striking thing, if you look at countries that are changing financially, like, like India, like Brazil, like South Africa, one of their biggest rises in expenditure is substances. You know, uh, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and so on. We value, part of our problem is our species really values these molecules, even though they have no nutritive value, but God, we love them, right? So when we get more money, we spend more of them. So it's a simple kind of thing. If people just had more money, they wouldn't do this. That it seems not, not to be the case. All that said, you know, and, and we looked at this in the commission, it, there's still a good case always to make investments, particularly in the lives of kids and particularly in the lives of low income kids, to you know, build their capacities to handle many different challenges in life. And that you knows everything from uh, you know, um, prenatal care, uh, you know, nurse visiting programs with, with uh, moms to get kids off to a good start in life. There are prevention programs that, that not so much focus on drugs, but teach kids things like how do you recognize and manage your emotions? How do you, how do you have good relationships with other people? How do you connect with, with positive adults? And for, and for one kid, that may help them get less involved in drugs. For another kid, it may help them not have a mental health problem not, and not, have a, not drop out of school. All that is really, really good. Um, that will not, though, resolve this fundamental thing of our species really likes these things. The more available they are, uh, the, the more we are inclined to use them, and the more we use them, the more trouble that we have. So that, that's why the, the root cause explanation just doesn't seem to hold together very well for this particular problem. I mean, I think it's, it's also worth adding that the, the profile of, of people who are victims of addiction here in, in Canada is quite an interesting one. So um, most people assume that drug use uh, illicit drug use, say, so not alcohol, not tobacco, but, but, but illicit drug use would typically start in somebody's teenage years, maybe or early, early 20s. Fentanyl being so toxic, uh, the risk of overdosing being so high, you know, lots of deaths, but let's assume maybe that these people are dying in their 20s. They're not. These are the, the average, you know, in terms of, of, of looking at both BC and Alberta, the age profile is, is quite high. So across Canada as a whole, between uh, the age group is 30 to 39, most likely to, 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 to suffer from, from, from an overdose death. Um, in British Columbia, it's higher um, for reasons that we can't really uh, explain. So in, in, in BC, overall, it's, it's sort of more in the sort of 50 to 59 age bracket. So these are not people who necessarily came to drugs late in life. They're people who have been habitual users for potentially decades. Um, why, why British Columbia is interesting, I think, in that context is um, there could be inward migration. So there could be inward migration from other provinces to British Columbia by drug users. This is actually in defense. You know, if you were in, 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 in British Columbia and wanted to lobby the federal government, for example, for more investment, you would say actually one of our problems is that we are a, a net importer of people who have a very high demand for services. Um, now, they might be coming to Vancouver or the downtown east side for lots of other reasons. They might want to be around other, other users. They might want to access services that aren't available in Alberta. Um, but we can't think of an obvious explanation for why the, the, the age profile of people who die from opioid addiction would be so much higher in BC unless there was some um, population transfer going on as well. Okay. Um, I do want to get to some audience questions. I've got um, um, one last question myself on, it has to do with supply. Um, I mean, in, in, in the difference between the opioid crisis, a lot of people argue, and, and previous sort of drug crises is the, just the ease of the availability. Fentanyl is so much easier to make, it is so much easier to move. Um, is, it a, is it a fool's errand to try and stop the supply itself because it's so ubiquitous? 
Um, and is it, is it something, for example, that can be enforced at the border? Um, obviously, this was, you know, if going back to the 80s war on drugs, sort of stopping these drugs before they get into the country was a large part of the, the policy response. Is that... Is that a fruitful approach with opioids? Is it different? Yeah, so you have two different issues there. So can you ever, with supply control, reduce supply to nothing? No. Mm -hmm. It's never been true. It wasn't true in the 80s and so on. Does that mean you shouldn't do it? Also, no. I mean, you know, m many things, you know, we try to stop homicides. There's always going to be sure. homicides, but it is, it is noble to try, right? You do still raise prices. You also, with prohibition, you keep companies out of, uh, out of this space. I mean, look how fast cannabis has been marketed, how aggressively, uh, and the use has gone up. If companies had the access to do that with this, they would. So those are things you get, you get um, out of prohibition. At the same time, I think the synthetic revolution is really, really important, and it's much bigger than fentanyl. Look at methamphetamine. You know, now we have a, a quite robust methamphetamine market, um, a bit heavier in my country than yours, but you have it here as well. Australia has a massive methamphetamine problem. Again, same phenomena, economically speaking. No plants needed anymore, far less labor, far easier to hide, can pro be produced very close to the source. That is a really big challenge for supply control, for policing. And at this point, I don't think people quite know what to do. And I've said this in Congress, I've said this to very smart people, you know, like, you know, you, we need to rethink the whole uh, point when you don't have agriculture involved anymore. And by the way, there are some very good parts about this, more in broader foreign policy areas that many of you may be interested in. You could get to the point where it's no longer the case where wealthy countries are flogging poor countries for not growing drug crops because there won't be drug crops. So maybe they can improve those relationships and cooperate on other things. But it does create significant problems for drug control per se because of the compactness, because of lack of supply lines, because of the, you know, no more worries for the trafficker for things like weather light, uh, you know, a war, all that is all taken away. That, that is really a, a profound challenge uh, for everybody who works in this area, and I don't pretend to have a simple answer to it. No, and I think the, the other angle is that the interdiction or the sort of law enforcement upstream, whether it's the, you know, the, the production lab or, or, or the distribution networks might be more domestic as well in that sense, mm -hmm. so they might be easier to go, to go after. I mean, I think the, the, the what's been talked about in terms of fentanyl through the mail and these things are you, you can make more investments at airports and 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 in, in and in sort of shipping ports and what have you to try and detect these some of these 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 shipments but they're not they're not as easy as they were in the 80s or 90s when you're dealing with bulk um, contraband um, but I also think that there's a, a question that needs to be raised and I don't know the answer to it which is if the if the argument is that law enforcement has you know, a minimal role or only a certain upstream role around, you know, serious criminals involved in importing product or distributing. Why in Canada in 10 years have the cases of um, opioid deaths surged and the number of serious charges for trafficking, possession, uh, trafficking distribution and importation halved? I mean, that would, that would to me say either there has been a decision by uh, prosecutors and police that these cases are not worth going after, or there is something fundamentally more complicated about charging them. The sentencing framework isn't, isn't, isn't suited to them. As Keith says, you know, maybe the evidence is just much harder to gather and present, so police become discouraged and don't go, don't go after them. They may just be too resource intensive to, to pursue. But I don't think the, the sort of status quo of relaxing on possession and retrenching on serious sort of drug enforcement is the kind of environment that, that is useful when ultimately the business enterprises involved are, are, very, are very flexible and are very adaptive and are exploiting the addiction that, 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 that continues to grow here. Okay. <clears throat> well, as I said, I'd like to, um, to give the audience some time for questions. My, my colleague Jacqueline has a microphone and I guess we'll give the first question to our founder and managing partner, Brian McCarthy. Thanks very much. A, a, a fascinating discussion, and thank you so much for bringing so much rich data to the, the conversation, which uh, is usually carried on in, in the abstract, and we don't really understand the consequences of the ideas that we're talking about. I wanted to um, pick, on, uh, pick up on uh, something that was uh, said earlier. Um, uh, and by way of introduction, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I think Canada and the United States are, are societies that are 
deeply uh, liberal individualist. And I don't mean liberal in the sense of left wing, I mean liberal in the sense of freedom loving societies in which we believe quite fundamentally that um, uh, the purpose of society is to create a, a, a supportive framework in which the individual personality unfolds uh, according to the will of the person, right? Uh, but of course addiction, uh, it seems to me, is a terrible challenge to that whole model because precisely for the reason that uh, people can be grateful to the people who help them escape addiction when they didn't want to escape addiction, the, 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 the very fact of addiction is, um, uh, is a problem of the weakness of the will. People want not to be addicted, but they can't act on their, on their desire they are, because they are, they are a prisoner of their addiction. And it seems to me that this is a real challenge to liberal individualist society. How do we deal with people who, uh, you know, if you say to them, do you want to be addicted? They say, no. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, will you stop? No, I can't. So how do we as a, a, a society committed to the principles of liberal individualism help people who suffer from the problem of weakness of the will? That's, that's the, for me, that's the central problem. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I, um, our our uh, San Francisco paper, I wrote something uh, saying um, that we're thinking about it wrong. San Francisco's getting pilloried. You know, it's the reason it's having all these problems is because it's, it's uh, commitment to left-wingism. And I said, no, that's not true, actually. That's why we have services probably help people. It's, it's because it's a libertarian city. West Coast cities, uh, all up and down the coast, people went for freedom. They went, I don't want to be, I don't want to live in Boston. I don't care. I want anyone to ask me when my family got across the Mayflower. I want to be who I am. And that has had some enormously positive impacts on the life of you know, where I live. We, I don't think we would have Silicon Valley without that. I don't think we would have uh, gay and lesbian rights without that. That is all terrific. But then, as you say, then you get to this situation where the person's ability to maximize their own good is gone. And there are, there's a doctor near school who would say, no, no, then that's what they want to do. And it's interesting, that often turns into a very sort of sanctimonious way of being callous. I have so much respect for your freedom that I'm going to step over you as you die in drug overdose right in front of me, because I wouldn't want to impose my, my values upon you. Um, but most of us don't think that way. They think, actually, if that person were, were in there uh, a good, uh, if they had the reason before all this started, if they had that mental capacity, they would say, yes, please help me. Give me the naloxone. Take me to the hospital. I do not want to die this way. This is not the ultimate expression of who I am. And we haven't grappled through with that enough um, to the point that people can say, okay, generally we still like this, we like all this freedom, but it, there are cases where we have to do things that are, I'm, I'm gonna say paternalist, some people think, oh, paternalism is bad. Not, not, it's not always bad. Being a good father is paternalistic. I try to be one, I'm, I'm paternist. Uh, that, that, that can be good, right? Sometimes you set limits for your kids, they don't like it, it's for their own good. But in those situations, um, accepting that that is, that is true, that the person cannot advocate for themselves, and therefore either family, community, or the state has to do something. This raises issues immediately about well, what about if it's a violation of their rights, what if they're not adequately protected, all that stuff is still true, but I don't think that can stop us from saying, you know, we're gonna have to intervene. And I, and I know I'm going on this a bit, but let me just give you a very concrete example. When people make the argument that we shouldn't intervene, you know, it's their right, and I said, but I, I've, I volunteered at an agency in the worst hit neighborhood in San Francisco. I carry naloxone, which is an opioid rescue drug with me. I say, so if I saw somebody dying of an overdose, would, would I, uh, do you think I should give them that? And they go, oh yeah, absolutely. Said, but they can't consent, you know? They're dying, they, they can't even breathe. So I'm imposing my, well that's, that's different. Say, okay, if, if that's different, then what would it be, let's say they're awake, but they're on methamphetamine, and they're standing in a busy intersection with cars zooming by, and they're, they're uh, you know, screaming at them, and sooner or later they're gonna kill them. It, it, why is it then out of the common for you to say, well, just like I would save that person's dying, I would, might go grab that person, or if they were too big and strong, I might ask a police officer, please get them out of the intersection so they aren't killed. We all kind of you know, accept that there's times like that, and, and shouldn't get, um, I think too ideological of, you know, the, uh, of saying it's just always wrong to intervene. We all sort of really believe in some cases it is in the debates over where is that line exactly? How far out is it? 
you know, we know we don't want someone kicking down doors and grabbing somebody for smoking pot in their house, right? And, and, and we don't want someone to die in front of us, but where is that in between where we're going to say, okay, let's, let's use public policy here, even though the person doesn't consent to it at this moment? I think, I think the other thing to say is that um, my impression as a sort of foreigner, and I, I'd say you know, this is a, a challenge for a lot of jurisdictions around the world, and, and, and nobody has really, has really cracked it, but when, when I first started coming, my, my wife grew up in Vancouver. We would um, come on holiday before we moved here. And anyone who knows Vancouver knows that the downtown east side is, um, is a very challenging place. Um, there is something about the visibility of this problem and the concentration of the problem in the downtown east side that makes it much more visible to people, the sense that it has got worse and that it has spread. Um, so there is a, a, a sort of challenge there with, you know, is the public culture tolerant of um, people's rights to consume um, illicit substances in private, so long as we don't see it? Um, and when does that tip over into general concern, not just about the, the sort of physical impact of seeing it yourself um, in sort of close to the downtown, but also the sense that there is a a part of your city which is, um, be, you know, that there is a sort of permitted zone of lawlessness and disorder, um, which I think a lot of people visiting Vancouver who don't maybe come from 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 BC find completely hard to, to, to understand. There's no way that a European, any European city, would let, would allow that kind of degradation of the public realm. Um, and what's interesting, for example, about England, so we were doing some work around this national drug strategy in the UK. Um, the UK has an opioid addiction problem, not quite as bad. Um, it has a very well, well, it's now better funded than it was, but a, a, a maintenance and, and treatment program for people in this situation. But if the mayor of the West Midlands, for example, was a very progressive, um, political figure who decided that the Vancouver approach was the right one and had decided that there was an area of Birmingham that would be allowed to develop in the same way that the downtown east side, there would be a national political intervention before it got anywhere near the current stage of, of development. So, and I know that Canada's different and I know the role of the feds and the, the provinces in this is very, is very complicated and very clearly demarcated in terms of who funds what, but it just, it seems odd to me as an outsider that that any government at a national level would allow that level of poverty and despair and degradation to, to, to not just exist in, in a major city, but to become um, entrenched and, 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 and you know, so obviously um, destructive, not just the, the people involved, but the communities around it. Okay. Um, sorry, I saw up here in the front. Uh, I don't mean the microphone, I'm sure. quite loud, but uh, I, want, I would just like to follow on that because uh, if there was an opportunity for the two of you to have a captive audience about five kilometers from here um, in, the, in the House of Commons, talk to decision makers who may be not impacted by the politics of the day, but uh, what would you recommend that they do? We are a public policy think tank and try to recommend a better way. I'm hearing a lot of problems, but in terms of what you could offer as potential solutions, even short-term solutions, we had opioid problems before we had COVID. And I'm not saying the policies that were taken by the government were good policies, but they act. Um, what would you say to do to parliament or any strike decision makers? Yeah, so there's many things, and I encourage everyone to look at the, uh, uh, the Lands Commission, which covered both the US and Canada, and it's online for free, just opioids.stanford.edu. Um, but there's a whole range of things. First off, you have to make sure you have intelligent and careful prescribing in your healthcare system, because remember, that's where this problem started. And yes, it's opioids now, but these, everything that happened to opioids can happen with benzodiazepines, with gabapentin, with many other medications. So you use the, the and that's a group you have far more control over than you do drug dealers, right? So that, that's really important. Second, with the um, systems of care, I would look at Alberta for thinking about what you're doing in the context of a system with the goal to produce recovery. You have different kinds of components, but they all have to work together in a logical, uh, cohesive way, sort of give people pathways out of the uh, disorder. I'm really impressed with the way Alberta's doing it, but the whole, the whole country should be doing it. Third, just have to give a little story. You know, there was a period where we said the police can take care of this by themselves. 
That didn't work. Now we're in sort of a fantasy that people like me, health people, can take care of it by, by ourselves. That's also a fantasy. So kumbaya, as it sounds, there has to be models of working together between law enforcement, public health, and public safety. And just to give one concrete example of the, the Blair and I know well, because we worked on it in, in, the, in the UK, is you know mandatory kinds of sobriety programs. So people who get arrested over and over and over again, let's say I drink and drive one, two, three, four, five times, um, I am put on a system where I am monitored all the time for my drinking once or twice a day by breathalyzer or potentially with a bracelet. Um, I'm allowed to stay free. I don't have to go to jail. I don't lose my job. But it, the second that I, I use that substance, there is a consequence imposed by the criminal justice system. Perhaps a modest one, like we'll hold you in jail for one night. But unlike most things the criminal justice system does, swift and certain. You offer people treatment. You offer people all kinds of health and support. But it's backed up by the criminal justice system saying we are not going to accept this behavior anymore. That was started in South Dakota by a friend of mine, Larry Long. Uh, it, it's been evaluated extremely intensively. Um, it sh shows big effects reducing drink driving, reducing violence against women, and reducing incarceration. That's now spread throughout a lot of the Western United States. It's spread, through, thanks heavily to Blair and some friends of ours in the UK, spread throughout England and Wales. It really should be operating here in Canada as well. That's an example of that kind of model. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that there's, there's you know, we shouldn't be defeatist. There's definitely um, some things that, that are working here and that continue to work. So I, 10 years ago, I remember sitting with the, the, the judge in the community court in the downtown uh, east side of Vancouver, and, and, and that was actually what sort of inspired us in, in, in England in terms of policy making, looking at whether we could get the courts, particularly in the family court space, to do a bit more problem solving justice. And those, those models do clearly work. There are licensed medications now that are being um, used, for example, in Alberta quite, quite um, quite proactively, um, one is called um, Sublicade, um, and Sublicade is um, you know, a very helpful tool because it can, get, can satiate those, those, those cravings for up to 30 days through a, simple, through a simple injection. It's been licensed in the US, it's been licensed in Canada, it's actually produced, I think, in, in the UK. Uh, hasn't been licensed in Europe yet, but these new licensed medications are also very helpful tools. It's about creating the kind of, what scaffolding does does, does the person who's suffering from addiction need around them? You know, is there the family intervention? Is there the recovery setting? Is there the peer group support? But also, is there the, the, the medical treatment as well to kind of give them the, the support so that they can rebuild, rebuild their lives? And as, as Keith says, you know, that recovery um, goal shouldn't be politicized. It shouldn't be something that's seen as a conservative thing. It should be seen as a, um, as a noble, you know, aspiration that we should have for people who, who are in, in deep distress. And I think the, the other thing that we would say, and this sounds boring from, from, from researchers all the time, but you know, we've had this problem now for two decades and we still don't have some of the basic information architecture out there. Some of the data collection is really bad. I'm sure some of the data is being collected, but it's not routinely shared or published. And you know, again, as, a, as an outsider, you know, maybe this is at, at the point now where it is Canada's biggest health crisis, and there's a, a discussion to be had about the role of the federal government because, you know, the BC, you know, in, in British Columbia, they declared a, a, a public health emergency in 2016, uh, after which, you know, deaths have doubled. So, you know, at what point do do provincial governments run out of levers here, um, and what might federal intervention look like? I think there has to be a debate about that as well. Mr. Uh, Jackman, we've got someone in the back here. Yes. Um, and this is a little bit out of my territory. I'm, I'm, I'm a um, daily reader of newspapers and, and online services, and I'm aware of the opiate crisis, but I'm not, this is not an area of attention that I have personally, right? But I do have a question that may, perhaps is very naive, and that is, are there any correlations, or is there a correlation between the utilization, increased utilization of opiates and the increased narrative in around mental illness? in society. Um, I, for one, have been around for six decades. In the last decade or two, there's been an increased awareness of the state of mental illness. And I'm not being judgmental at all in terms of what that state is. But is there a correlation between increased utilization and mental illness? So you, it, it, when in just about every study that's been done of, of questions like, if you have a surgery, 
and you're going to be given opioids afterwards, will you develop a problem or not? Or you have a bad knee and you've get, you're given some pills, will you have a problem or not? Mental health indicators are a fairly good predictor that you're at higher risk. Depression, uh, de you know, um, challenges with self-control, history of other types of addictions, uh, anxiety and so on. Because these drugs are euphoric and they're quite reinforcing in the short term, you know, if you, if you have sort of a generally kind of blue affect, you know, it's, it's a lift up. So um, that's definitely the case and you know, we do now do a lot, much more training with providers, for example, to screen people for depression, for anxiety, before they write the script for the person after, for the surgery, for the pain, and so on. So you, know, you can definitely see a case for linkage there. And it's also been generally true around the world that good mental health systems um, will help people who are addicted because they have overrepresentation of lots of different types of problems. We, and, and if you go to the most extreme end, people who have serious mental illnesses, you know, psychotic disorders where they're out of touch with, with reality, their rate of having problems with drugs are always, in every society you look at, a multiple of people who don't have those conditions. I could also interject just related to the data in the report. We did look at the, we did look at the correlation between perceived mental health in the different provinces. We didn't find that it was, like, there was, it was a bit worse in BC, but it wasn't overall, like, clearly worse in BC or Alberta. That didn't seem to be a causal factor, but it wasn't that strong data that we found. Um, second row here, this one. Thank you. This is a very fascinating discussion, and I'm from Alberta, so I'm seeing some of the pilot programs in that recovery-oriented system of care versus kind of the harm reduction approach of BC. And even in Ontario, they have the sort of Working for Workers Act, and they're tackling it from a more labor perspective. But I just wondered, in terms of the availability of naloxone in communities, if there's any studies that kind of point to that, because um, in prairie provinces, it's not accessible unless you're deemed high risk, and then it's up to the pharmacist or somebody making that judgment call of looking at you, are you high risk? Do you look like you're a, you know, a, a user? And I, I just wonder because there's been some, like the CDC in BC has been very hard line that they are against nasal. They just, they're, you know, the users already are comfortable with needles, so they stick to the IM. And I just wondered if in any other jurisdictions or studies if that community accessibility of naloxone, even in Alberta that's investing in all this recovery-oriented systems of care, they have been reluctant to invest in nasal naloxone. There are 10,000 new beds that they're creating, but that, that point, Aaron, you made about keeping people alive so that they can get to treatment, it seems like a, a no-brainer in that jurisdiction. And I just wondered if, if in your yeah. studies you encountered that. Yeah, so we were at the summit in Alberta uh, just, I guess it was February recently, and their, their latest naloxone data is, if I remember right, they're, they're distributing about 50,000 doses per quarter. So it's actually quite quite a, a fair amount, and they've, they've up, uh, upped it a lot. I didn't ask about formulations. I don't know if they're using natal or needle. I can tell you that I think it's really important to have the nasal one because a lot of the people who want to administer it are scared to death of needles, you know, um, or, or they just don't like them, like, you know, firefighters, cops, um, librarians, um, bar, bartenders, there's lots of people who can encounter someone in an overdose and they don't, they don't want to give an injection. And, and there, there's, nasal doesn't always work, there's only so much you can absorb that way, but it's way better than, than, than doing nothing. So um, yeah, that should be a, available. I think probably the most interesting intervention in this space is that probably in the next week or two, the American FDA is going to approve an over-the-counter naloxone. So if that happens, the, the unit price would drop pretty dramatically, and um, also there would no longer be interaction with the pharmacist. Yeah. There's some risk there, because you know, you, your pharmacist can tell you useful things, here's how to use it, and also don't forget to call, and, uh, call for emergency services and all that. But on the other hand, that could make it so, so cheap that it would um, you know, sort of uh, sur surmount some of the access problems that, we, that we've had. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned the need for what you said, intelligent and careful um, prescription practices. Uh, have you seen a significant change in the practices from medical professionals? And has there been significant change in their training? And is that change 
assuming it happened? Is it proportional to the severity of the crises? Uh, that's a really good question. So um, I'm more familiar with American uh, medical education than Canadian medical education. It's definitely true that the information on things like Health Canada gives about opioids is much more conservative than it was in the, in the heyday of prescribing. Um, I notice a big change with the young doctors that uh, I interact with about how much more cautious they are, e even apart from it, before I even open my mouth. But you know, they, they can read the newspapers like anybody else. Far more cautious. If you look at per capita prescribing, uh, in, uh, the, the, the massive growth in Canada and the United States stopped and has actually started to go back the other direction. U U.S. is down pretty, pretty significantly. I'm not sure what Canada is, but Canada has also you know, come off a bit. So you, can, you, you definitely see all those things. We also, in the States, just got a law in, so, so the way it works in the United States is the, the state, the, you know, like a U.S. state gives you your medical license, but to, get a, uh, to be able to prescribe, uh, p controlled substances, you have to get the federal government to allow you to do that. And we just passed a law that you can't do that anymore without having training in addiction. We used to always have that just for people who were specialists in addiction, but the thinking was, which we supported in the commission, is that everybody's going to deal with addiction. So if you're working in general practice, you think, well, I just don't interact with addicted people. Sure you do. They may not admit it, but, but you do. Or if you're a surgeon, I don't do it. Hey, you do. It, 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 it's such a common condition, and it's often going to present to you as something else, but it's there. So it's good for you to know how to identify it, how to manage it, and also how not to cause it. Okay. I think we've got time for one last question, so we'll go right back here. Hi, my name is Anvish Jain. I'm a law student at the University of Ottawa. So Sam Cooper, one of our leading journalists at Global News, has written extensively on the multiple interlocking elements that have contributed to the fentanyl overdose crisis in Vancouver and on Canadian streets more generally. Uh, these elements include a supply chain fed by uh, you know, overseas triads or gangs based in other countries and the domestic casino industry here. And in Canada, we have a very strong concept of the division of powers between the federal and provincial governments that may be inducing coordination issues in tackling these problems. So are there any unique solutions you may be able to envisage from the American or British experiences in overcoming similar, juris similar jurisdictional problems? Um, I'm curious, do you, want, do you want to stand with me too? Like, um, I would like to, but I need to think about yeah. the UK. So I think pro pro yeah, pro so probably the, U the UK being a bit more centralized. So, mm -hmm. so we, you know, we have these, time, these precise types of problems, like a state can't have a navy, right? Um, and yet they, they can um, suffer importation, you know, um, from other countries and, and so it's really a foreign policy issue. You don't think the federal government would be involved, but the, but the damage then occurs in that state. So, um, you know, I think those issues always come up of, you know, for us it's states and the federal, for you it's, it's provinces and the federal government. Who's responsible for what? There's certainly things you can do because at the federal level, you know, border control, also the mail system is going to be run by the federal government. There are things you can do in mail. There's, a, there's some detection technologies you, know, you can use. Um, and then there's the foreign policy negotiation uh, context. One, one reason we did actually get some progress around 20, 2018 or so, we had a slight drop was um, that the American government persuaded the Chinese government to schedule some of the stronger fentanyls, like carfentanil. And there was a drop in deaths that, that certainly benefited the, uh, the American upper Midwest, places like Michigan, Ohio. It probably benefited uh, Western Canada as well, where there, where there, as it was a little sort of inexplicable drop. That's something a province or a state can't do. That, has, that, that actually, I know someone who's in the meeting, that was actually negotiated head to state to head to state. Um, so, so that has, has to be there. Whereas the services on the ground, pretty much have to be run, you know, at the local level to be sensible. It's a long way away. Um, you know, Ottawa's a long way away from, from uh, uh, Vancouver. Washington, D.C. is a long way from where I live. And so that kind of stuff has to be tightly tailored to what are the particular drugs you have, the populations you serve. And for that, I think the best is to have autonomy kept at that level of the state or the city. Yeah, I mean, the, the UK experience is interesting because obviously the, the worst affected area is Scotland. And, and I remember many um, issues where um, the Scottish government was, you know, actively lobbying for um, to have their own safe consumption sites to open open those for the first time. And the reserved power for the Home Office in London was was to decide whether or not that would be permitted, and 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 we refused. But um, the investment that we we decided to make, you know, because the Prime Minister at the time, Sir Boris Johnson, cared about this issue. He 
he understood the arguments that we were making around the sort of retrenchment around um, treatment, investment, and some of the services that, 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 that had been cut during kind of a period of austerity under the sort of Cameron government. We, we tried to reverse that, and, and there was a question about whether we should change the commissioning model. Um, we didn't get to the point of agreeing that, so instead we just managed to secure the money to put more investment into treatment. But in, in England, you, of course, you have a national health system, and then treatment is commissioned by councils, so municipalities. Um, there isn't this regional or sort of provincial um, level of government in between. Um, that means really that there's a bit less buck passing because councils are just you know, small and rather insignificant and they have some powers but not, not anywhere near what, what cities have in North America. So most of the success or failure of, of policy in this space accrues to, to ministers in, in London. So it's up to them to make the right choices and to make the investments and to claim the credit or, or to accept the, the criticism for it. So, um, but I'm, you know, I'm very aware that you've got this, this constitutional challenge here where um, you know, the, the federal government is perhaps inclined not to, um, not to interrupt somebody when they're making a mistake. And I don't know whether that, that is how they see BC or, or not, but um, I just think from, a, from, from, as I say, the British perspective, it would be um, inconceivable that a large part of the country would be adopting a policy that looks like it's not working and the federal government doesn't really have any apparent desire to intervene in any way. Um, and I don't just mean intervene by giving BC what it's asking for in terms of more health funding. I mean actually doing what maybe only the federal government can do, which is decide, you know, what does success look like? What are we trying to achieve here? Are you measuring things in the right way? Can we even compare anything that you're doing with a neighboring province? Um, and what level of accountability is there for some of this spend? So, so I think that is a legitimate role for federal government, even if, even if they shouldn't be running healthcare. Um, and I think we're now at the point where that crisis is so acute that, that there could be, a, could be a justification for, for some federal intervention. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both for this fascinating discussion. I know the debate is going to continue around this issue for quite some time, but I think we can all agree that uh, increased public and political attention to such a serious problem is, is very welcome. So please join me in uh, thanking Keith and Blair for their remarks today. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, we'd like to invite you to join us for some light refreshments outside. Thank you.